Well, I did it. I finally did it. After 14 years, I've beaten Lost Odyssey. No use for the past. Back in 2008, Miss Walker Studios released Lost Odyssey on the Xbox 360, and this was Xbox's attempt at trying to round out their gaming library with some JRPGs. We would later get Blue Dragon and Last Remnant and a few other games. But Lost Odyssey was a game that I was highly anticipating. I was super excited for it, and I picked the game up on launch, played it day and night, got to disc four, and I never finished it. I don't even really remember why I never finished it. I just know I never did, but now here I am, 14 years later and I just finished Lost Odyssey doing as much of the side content as I possibly could stomach and is the game as good as I remember it? Well, sort of. To catch you up in case you don't know anything about Lost Odyssey, Lost Odyssey is a game that follows Kaim Argonar, who is a mercenary in line? No, what's the word? He's a mercenary working for the kingdom of Ura. Now, Kaim is a bit of a special case in that he's super powerful and he can't die because he's an immortal, but he also can't remember the last 1,000 years of his life. And after returning from a battle that was abruptly ended by a giant meteor hitting the battlefield, Kaim is then sent back out to investigate this giant staff that is supposed to keep the magic in the area under control clearly didn't because of the meteor and so he teams up with seth and jansen but once they get to the staff they realize there's something going on here there's more than meets the eye <laughs> transformers there's more than meets the eye and there's this conspiracy taking place to overthrow all the kingdoms of this land and someone that they know very well is behind it and now it's up to them to bring a stop to it now lost odyssey is developed by one of the creators of final fantasy Hironobu Sakaguchi. Now, Final Fantasy's influence is on full display in this game, from the character's designs to the music, which is masterfully done by Nobuo Uematsu, to the combat, to there's a lot of stuff in here that will make you think, oh yeah, this is kind of like Final Fantasy. Especially since there's a character who is an engineer and his name is Sed. It's very similar to Sid. I've heard people say that Lost Odyssey is a Final Fantasy ripoff. And I've always thought that critique was kind of just dumb. I mean, you have the creator, one of the creators of Final Fantasy working on a game. So yeah, there's going to be some influence, but I'm not really here to debate if this game is a Final Fantasy ripoff. What I'm here to talk about is my experience playing this game in 2022 and if it was worth the 14 year wait that it took me to finish this game. And so I wanna start off with two of the things that I think really make Lost Odyssey stand out as a JRPG, and it's the thousand years of memories and the battle system. Now, since Kaim and the other Eternals, sorry, Immortals, lost their memory, you recover their memories by playing through the game and interacting with certain scenes that unlock memories from their past. And this is all compiled in what's called the thousand years of memories. You can access it from the main menu or you can access it while you're playing the game and you're resting at an inn. Now these memories were written by, and let me get it, Kiyoshi Shigematsu, who is known for his works like Naifu, IG. He's a prolific writer in Japan and he, a lot of his writings center around family. And so there's themes of like love, connection, wholesomeness, that kind of stuff. And you really see that on display in these memories. A lot of these memories carry a lot of weight. These memories serve as a way for you to get to know these characters more and see some of the adventures that they had prior to the start of this game. Now, when I played this game back in 2008, the stories hit pretty hard and there's still hit just as hard in 2022 if not a little bit harder there's one story that i can think of specifically where kai meets this one character in a town who is unsure if he wants to or is even ready to settle down with his wife and start a family and so he's begging kai to let him come with him on his adventures it's a pretty gripping story i'm not gonna lie and i remember when i first played this game back in 2008 i thought it was so cool to be able to live forever like how cool would that be right but this game through its 
its memories and through its storytelling revealed that being an immortal is more of a curse than anything else. As you read through these stories, you'll meet different characters that Kaim and Seth and a few of the other immortals that they've met and some of the ways that they've impacted their lives, but you'll also see loss. These characters that they grew close to, but because they're human, they died. And you see this, you feel the weight, you feel the emotion in the writing. And it's, it's something that is wholly unique to this game that I haven't really encountered in another game that it's just mm, chef's kiss. It's good. Now, truth be told, you don't really have to read these stories to enjoy the game, but I think you're really doing yourself a disservice if you're playing this game and you're not reading these stories. You don't got to read all 31 or 32 of them, however many there are. But you do need to at least read a handful of them just to see just how good the storytelling is with these memories. Now, something else you're going to have to do in this game is fight. It's a JRPG. What, what else are you going to do in the game? But not only just fight, this game really pushes you to pay attention to your gears, your gears. This game pushes you to pay attention to your gear, your skills, how you're building out your characters, because that will make or break a fight that will make or break your progress is putting you to a full stop during the story or even the side stuff. Now, if you've played any JRPG, you kind of know the basics to how turn-based combat works. With Lost Odyssey, Lost Odyssey has a mechanic that's similar to FF9. No, not that FF9 silly, this FF9. And in this game, it's called Skill Link. So similar to Final Fantasy IX, you can equip a piece of gear, your character absorbs that particular buff that the gear has, and then you can use that to attach it as a skill, and then you can continue learning skills from your gear that allows you to build out your character the way that you want them to be built out. If you want Kaim to be a super buffy tank boy, you can do that. If you want Kaim to be a super hard hitting DPS guy, you can do that too. If you want Jansen to be your super talkative nurse healer thing in your party, you can do that. I actually had a lot of fun doing that and just trying to kind of min max some of these characters and see kind of what I can do and what I can really pull off and kind of what skills have a really good synergy together. It was a really cool mechanic of the game that I really, really enjoyed. But another thing that you need to pay attention to is the rings. So if you like a character, you better put a ring on them because that's another way that they can learn a new skill. And as you equip a ring to your character, when you go into combat and you attack, then this closing ring will show up that you'll have to hold down right trigger to time it just correctly. And if you hit that sweet spot landing the circle on top of another circle you'll get a critical hit and if your weapon has a ability to apply a status effect to an enemy it'll apply it and so it's really cool it was kind of tense but once you get the hang of it and you kind of listen to the certain specific chimes and think of it more of as a rhythm game it kind of becomes a little bit easier to pull off these these perfect uh these perfect hits As cool as these two things are, this is a game that came out in 2008. And in my opinion, there's some games that have came out after that because we've gotten a lot of JRPGs since then. And we've even gotten some that came out before this. There's some things that I felt those games did better than Lost Odyssey in the departments of characters and leveling up. And when I first played this game in 2008, I remember liking the characters. But when I booted this game up recently over the summer and started playing it, I realized that the majority of the cast didn't really care for. Seth is a cool character, but she's kind of that typical Sundarei character that you see in anime who's just kind of angry at everything that is, you know, a guy or stupid or whatever. And so she's always kicking things or hitting things. And it was funny to see her beat up Jansen, but at the same time, it was just kind of like, like this character gives me whiplash with, with how much they, they sway from emotion to emotion. Jansen... Oh my gosh. Jansen is a lot like the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies now where they don't let scenes breathe or have weight because they always have to inject some kind of comedy into those scenes. And Jansen's very much the same way. Come on now, you know you just do way too much talking and not enough listening, you know? Silence, you idiot. Hey, I ain't shutting up. There's moments that are heavy in this game and you're supposed to feel something, but then Jansen just doesn't shut up and it, he kind of ruins it in my opinion. I, I don't really care for Jansen. I would much rather have Olivier from Trails in the Sky. And then you have characters like Mac and Cook who are kind of like him and Paulo from Final Fantasy IV. I think I got their names right. That, in my opinion, I just found them to be kind of useless in combat. I didn't really use them that much. And really kind of begs the question, why are we bringing kids onto this giant 
world saving adventure where they could possibly die and they're facing giant monsters. They could freeze to death. Kind of getting into spoiler territory here and I won't go any further. It's just, I don't know, it, it was weird to have them in there, but I guess I didn't complain about it in Final Fantasy IV, so I'll just leave it as it is, I guess, whatever. And then there's Ming and Let's be honest, we know why Ming is in the game. While she's a great caster, I just, her outfit was like, this is, the, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, we're used to pretty ridiculous outfits for characters in Final Fantasy and in other JRPGs, but this one just kind of really pushed it. And really, the only characters that I really liked were Kaim, Sarah, and Sed. Although Sed kind of got on my nerves a few times, but those are the really the only three characters that I really liked. Kaim was cool. He was a great leader. Sarah was a great, compassionate person, um, a mother figure, so to speak, to Mac and Cook. And Sed was, I mean, Sed's pretty much Sid. So, I mean... He, you get why you get why that's cool. But even Gongoro was just kind of so cartoonishly evil that I just didn't really take him seriously. You know, he, he's the kind of guy that's like, oh, I felt emotions and I liked it. Now I want all the power for myself because he likes it. Oh, my gosh. Gongora is literally Bully Maguire from Spider-Man 3. Gonna cry. Now, I mentioned earlier that I think JRPGs handle leveling a little bit better than Lost Odyssey does. Lost Odyssey has this weird thing with its combat and its XP where as you play through at least the first three discs, you'll go through certain areas, fight enemies, and then once you reach a certain level, it'll just either stop giving you XP or give you one to two points of experience. I guess this was the game's way of trying to balance out some sort of difficulty. And I'll admit that the game did manage to stay difficult throughout the entirety of the game. Not too difficult to where it makes you want to quit the game, but difficult enough to where you really need to stay on top of building out your characters, using the skill link system, applying different rings when need be. It was cool to be able to change out your equipment during a fight so that way if you come across an enemy that is weak to water or something but you don't have anything equipped that handles that you can swap it out in the middle of the fight but i will say that the first griffin boss you fight is a major skill check in this game but what I what I didn't like about it is that you can't really effectively grind for experience until you get to disc four, which thankfully doesn't really take a whole lot of time. You'll probably get there within 20 hours or so if you're playing the game. But it just felt weird to me because that's just not how I play JRPGs. When I play JRPGs, I like to sit down, put my put my earbuds in, pull up an episode of the Reform Gamers podcast, which you should totally be listening to. There's a whole playlist of episodes here on the YouTube channel. And then just get my characters over leveled or at least level them up to where they can handle the next threat or whatever it is pretty easily easily enough. What I did in Dragon Quest, that's what I did in all the other Final Fantasy games, and I just wish I could have done it here, but it is what it is. Now, thankfully, there's plenty of optional content, especially when you get to disc four. The game just really opens up and you can just go explore the world. You can go do a lot of different side quests, go visit a lot of different areas. And what's cool about these areas is that they're short. They're, they're little contained areas that don't take too long to get through, with the exception of the hidden temple place at the very end that just allows you to get better weapons. It allows you to fight new enemies. And wait, a minute. one of the secret enemies in this game is a persona. So does that mean Lost Odyssey and Persona are connected? Does that mean Lost Odyssey is better than Persona? I'm just kidding. And so I finished Lost Odyssey in around at around 50 hours doing almost all the side content. The only stuff I didn't really do was the arena content stuff with, I believe, Mac is who it was. Honestly, despite my problems with the game, I did enjoy the game for the most part. I did enjoy playing through it all the way through to the end and reaching the credits. And there's some things that I really think Lost Odyssey does really, really well, like with a thousand years of memories, the combat, it just does a really unique thing with its storytelling that I wish more JRPGs would kind of delve into a little bit. But at the same time, I don't know if I can call Lost Odyssey one of my top favorite JRPGs anymore. Is it a solid JRPG? Absolutely. But I don't know that it's one of my all time favorites anymore, but I will say that I am greatly disappointed that this game never got a sequel. And I'm disappointed that Miss Walker Studios never really continued making games for the Xbox 360. And now they just make JRPGs for the iOS store. But like seriously, Fantasian is actually really good. I wish I could play that on my PC or my Switch or something instead of my phone. But I'm glad that I finished Lost Odyssey. And after 14 years, I think it was worth the wait of playing through it. I'm glad I finally got to play this game through backwards compatibility on my Xbox and see it all the way through to the end. Just wish there was a sequel that, that would continue uh, these characters' stories. 
And so now it's your turn. Have you played Lost Odyssey? What do you think about it? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, if you like this video, you kind of know how YouTube works. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. But as we say here on TRG, be a deer, keep it locked here, and I'll see you in the next video.